Today, I want to talk about a fellow called Will Eisner, who is generally considered the father of the American graphic novel. Now, the idea of cartooning has been big in France or Japan, so they have their own traditions. But in the American tradition, everybody in the industry regards Will Eisner as one of the founding figures. So I thought if we took a look at his career and his work, it would help you in doing interpretations of other graphic pieces that you'll see in this course. And I think overall, this will be a pretty entertaining program for you to look at. Interestingly, the term graphic novels, I wouldn't say is controversial, but it certainly gets used in different ways. And the fellow who makes this quote here, Jules Pfeiffer, actually worked for Mr. Eisner in his studio for several years. And he brings up the point that we call them graphic novels really sort of as a label to get them carried in proper bookstores rather than in comic book stores so that they could be in there with regular paperback novels and reference books and other things. And Pfeiffer takes the position, well, we say graphic novel because that sounds fancy and people don't want to say cartoon. Whereas, as I said, in other countries, cartooning is considered a totally valid art form and the profession of being a cartoonist, yes, that's a proper job. That's a high art career. And in fact, when they made a film about Eisner's career, ironically, the title of it was Profession Cartoonist. So as an easy way of thinking about it, the graphic novel is just going to be a long form presentation done in a comic book style. So it might be 100 pages, 200 pages, where it's actually telling a novel length story or it is collecting several short stories like you would collect Edgar Allan Poe's short stories into a hardcover book. So when we think of it that way, we understand that the graphic novel is a bigger, longer, coordinated piece of material. So when you take a look at your excerpt from Mouse, yes, that was a graphic novel that ran over actually two books. But if you look at this type of art style, it's not trying to be perfectly photographically, anatomically exact. So in cartooning, you'll exaggerate a character's nose or ears or eyes or their physique, or you'll have an excessive number of wrinkles on their clothes to make them look rumpled. So it's an amplifying, exaggerating kind of way of drawing. So it's not intended to look as if you were looking at a photograph, but it is intended to give you the idea of a character or a setting or a personality by exaggerating some characteristics of whatever it is that's being portrayed. So when we say a cartoonist, that's slightly different than an illustrator. If somebody is trying to do an illustration, like when I worked in newspapers, I had to draw a set of furniture for a black and white ad for a furniture store. I couldn't cartoon that furniture. It had to be exact in proportion and its details because they wanted it to look like real furniture. Whereas a cartoonist would be able to exaggerate some shapes or use the shapes differently. So when we say a, a cartoonist versus an illustrator, we're talking about that creative exaggeration. The basics about Mr. Eisner's career, born in New York, passed away down in Lauderdale Lakes here in Florida. So big surprise, somebody from New York retires to Florida like that never happens. But he ran his own art studio back in New York. He did graduate from high school. And in New York, they have specialized high schools for industrial arts. There's even a uh, an illustrating school that that is a high school equivalent program. But the third point here is one that I think is really interesting. 
Oftentimes, if you're an artist or a writer, you get hired to do a job, to write one script or to illustrate one script. And then you try and sell them to different companies and hopefully make repeat sales. In the time when Eisner was starting, it was much more prestigious to have a strip that ran in newspapers rather than in comic books because newspapers were distributed nationally. So we would see something like Peanuts that would run in the newspaper in Boston or Los Angeles or Philadelphia, wherever. And a lot of newspapers today still would have a Sunday comics section, but it would be several different stories from several different creators. Eisner's idea was, what if I sell the whole section to the newspaper? Meaning that his studio would produce all the stories and all the art, and this package of 24 pages worth of content would be sold directly to the paper in New York or Chicago or St. Louis, wherever. What did that mean? It meant he controlled the whole format. Sometimes he would come up with the ideas for characters and hand them off to his employees to continue the work. But also meant he got to keep all the money because he was the one creating the book and selling the whole thing. So imagine a city like, let's say, Cleveland has the Cleveland Plain Dealer newspaper. And at the height of it, maybe it's distributing 75,000 copies on Sunday around the Cleveland area. Then you take every major city, like any city that's got an NFL team. So Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, that's a lot of money to be made. So this allowed him to employ dozens of writers and artists because they weren't putting out one book a month. They were putting out one book a week. So it took a lot of people to do that work. He was able to give jobs to a lot of people and help a lot of people start their careers because he had the idea, let's put out the whole thing ourselves rather than be out here as a bunch of individuals struggling, trying to sell stories to whoever, whenever. Let's just run the whole business ourselves and put out the whole thing and sell it all over the country. So that's a pretty strong, successful idea. I make the point that he used the film noir cinematic style. At the time that he was producing the books, you know, one of the popular themes in movies was the black and white movie with shady women and rugged detectives and crime stories and mystery stories with deep shadows and uh, twisted plots and surprise endings. So why couldn't you do that on paper just as well as you would do it on a movie screen? So he used a lot of those same ideas. If he could set up a panel in a story the same way that Orson Welles would set up a frame in a movie. So having that eye of a director to see that you're doing movie scenes, movie lighting, movie angles, but that's just in the way that you're drawing it, you can give the reader a much more interesting experience. And of course, this flowed into other artists who recognized what he was doing. He's also one of the people who speaks to the New York Jewish immigrant experience. So there's a flavor in there that kind of overlaps with the New York in the era of the Great Gatsby and the Jewish experience is expressed in Mouse, the graphic novel from which you have some assignments. So that exists in here. This is branches off of the same tree. And he did use the short story style of people like O. Henry or Ambrose Beers, where the story takes you one direction and it takes you and takes you and takes you. And then at the ending, there's a twist. There's a surprise ending. And 
when you're telling your story in eight pages, you only have so much room to advance the plot. And then half of that last page is to tie it all up. And if there's a little twist to the ending, that makes those eight pages all the more interesting. But as a business person, and he had been drafted into the army during World War II, one of the things that he was able to do was to produce instructional comics that would be handed out to the soldiers. So that if you were going to tell a kid he was going to be the driver of a Jeep, and how does he take care of the Jeep? What's under the hood? What are the things you need to do before you take it out? Do you really want to give a technical manual of 15,000 words to somebody or an eight page little comic that has drawings of where the different parts are and very short descriptions of how to change the oil or how to check the starter, or how to change a tire? And the Army found that was so beneficial. Not only did did Eisner's company continue producing these things for 25, 35 years, but I just checked when I was making this lecture, they are still being produced. They do them online, but they still produce training manuals in this same format. And I'll show you a sample because I have some of them here at home. So I'll give you a look at how that technique was pulled off. But somebody who is this thoughtful about what you would not think of as a serious subject, he has passed on his knowledge. He's written many textbooks about the art techniques and the process of storytelling. So there are many writers and artists today who refer to what he did to improve their techniques, to make their work more commercially saleable. So there's a reason why this guy is worth talking about. From one of his textbooks, he says, when somebody is telling a story, there are really five purposes. So this could help you in anything that you have as a reading assignment where you're trying to find the theme. Because in every story, one of these threads, maybe more, is being pulled through the length of the story. So in whatever format, whether it's a TV show or a song or a poem, any expressive technique, when it's telling a story, there's something that is happening that we can look for. Is it teaching us behavior? Is it showing us bravery so that brave people understand this is how they ought to behave when they're in a stressful situation to discuss values is it teaching us pity or love or charity is something like that being expressed to satisfy curiosity if you watch a tv show about ancient rome none of us were alive back then but to find out about it we could tell you stories about people to illustrate what it was like to live in those times and what were the major wars or the major people that we want to learn about. Problem solving. You may have had a situation in your own life where you had some sort of decision and you were talking to somebody that you knew and that you trusted and you wanted to tell them, here is what happened to me. So-and-so said this, and then I thought that, but then they did this other thing. And you need to tell your story to kind of work through the process of all of those events and what you felt about them to come to the point of what you want to do about it. So the process of storytelling can actually help us figure things out. And of course, to share our dreams and fantasies. So I would like to take a trip to the South Sea Islands, Hawaii and Tahiti and all of those kinds of places. And I wonder what that would be like. I could read about them and then maybe in my mind come up with what it would be like to take that trip and to be there and in those places and see those geographical features. So you could actually sort of take that trip by writing or drawing a story without ever actually having been there. So 
kind of a transportation you could do in your mind. But Eisner teaches that one of those things, maybe more than one, are the whole reason why we bother to tell a story at all. So in our course, if you're looking at a novel or a short story or whatever it might be, you can probably find one of these five things going on in there. And if you can find it, which one of these that you want to use to represent your theme, then you find a few examples of how that was illustrated in the story. And there you go. You have an essay on the theme of whatever creative work you were assigned to examine. Here's an example of the newspaper section. The, this is the front page of it. So as I said, he put out the entire section of the newspaper and would have several stories in there and have his employees producing some of these other stories. But when I say there was a house style, it meant that their stories were going to be laid out a certain way. There was going to be a certain kind of illustration that they were going to do. There were going to be certain standards for how they used humor or how they used action, adventure, or violence in one of the stories. So there was sort of a company guide for that. And when he was off in the war, some of his employees would continue his stories. Literally, he would write scripts overseas, send them back, and then other artists would produce his stories under his name, which goes on at Disney and any of the major studios. But in order to keep the business going, sometimes employees had to learn how to draw as close to the way that he drew. But you see this illustration I have for you, it's from the Chicago Sun. So each newspaper would print it for themselves so they would receive the art and then they would produce it at their own printing plant and put their own names and dates and such on it. But I want you to notice a couple of things just on this page. So this is a Middle Eastern adventure that the character is going to have, but look at how the eyes are dotted in the character's name, in the spirit, right? The way those eyes are dotted is the star and crescent like you would see in the Turkish flag. And if you look through that flimsy curtain and you see the building in the background, that is actually the Blue Mosque or the Sultan Ahmed Mosque in Istanbul, Turkey. So in the way that he illustrated the lettering and in the way that he put an actual architectural feature, a famous building from a real place, He's told you that this story takes place in Turkey without ever actually having to say that word. And this idea of showing the story rather than telling the story will be something that we will touch on from time to time in this program. The first page of the story, as we just saw and as we see here, was one of his signature techniques. If you want people to open your book and read all the rest of your stories, the first picture they see, the way that you set up the story, has got to hook you. Just like the first scene in a movie or the opening titles on a TV show, I got to get you right now or you could change the channel. Or in the newspaper, you could put the comics aside and read the sports section. And when people make those choices, it affects advertising rates and all aspects of your business. So you want your first thing to really connect. Notice here the lettering for the character's name actually forms the shape of the building where the story is going to take place. He could have just drawn a big cube, a big rectangle and put windows on it and you would look at it and go, OK, that's a tall building. But you get a little bit more clever approach where the character's name shows up as an art element at the start of the story. So we get the high angle perspective of seeing a tall building and we get an idea that this is where it's going to take place. But we also get the name of the feature worked into the artwork. If you look at the right side of the page, 
where the three small illustrations are that show an elevator. They go down just like an elevator is going down from the top of the building to the lobby. So by moving from left to right and then seeing this go down the page, it makes you look at the page the way the artist wants you to see it so that you see the elements in the order that they want them presented so that you get the story in the proper order you get the clues to the mystery in the proper order. Whatever process they want to take the reader through, the way the art is arranged and the impression that it gives is part of the gimmick. This is part of what makes that happen. You see the coloration changes because a different newspaper had to print it. So if they didn't have specific color guides, they might make the background color different. And you see here, They've really only got red, blue, and gray working. So there are some papers that didn't have access to full color printing, but they would do these in tints and shades of mixing a limited number of colors. But the shape of the building and the way the character's name comes off still works because that was designed into the elements. So no matter what printer gets a hold of it, the story shape is still going to work correctly. So those are things that you can look for. You can look for how are the elements arranged, no matter how they're colored, does their shape take you somewhere? Here's an example of one of his comics that he did for education. And in fact, even though he was drafted to serve in World War II, he actually went to Vietnam later, 15, 20 years later, so that he could see what was going on in the Vietnam War, so that he would know what the soldiers' real problems were, what the Army really wanted them to learn how to do better, so he could see the actual equipment and the conditions, so that then his company could produce these easy-to-read, easy-to-learn guides for the soldiers, but they would take in the actual real-world issues that were necessary for the maintenance of the Army equipment. His influence continues. I mentioned that he had done many textbooks. So sequential art, which picture do you want to put in first on a given page? Or when they turn the page, what do you want them to be the first thing that they see when they turn the page? So you really control the reader's impression. He also produced books on how to draw figures. As I said, not in a perfectly correct photographic illustration way, but in a way that expressed the posture, the action, the personality, the emotions of what's going on with the characters. But even when you're doing that, you still wanna have arms and legs in the proper proportion and connected at the correct joints and such as that. So you have to be able to have both of those ideas at the same time. And I want to show you inside one of these books, he uses the techniques that he is teaching to teach you the very techniques. So he has panels and word balloons and thought balloons to move forward the information that would have just been in paragraphs in a textbook. So it's not just that he's going to tell you, he's going to show you, and he will tell you in the process of showing you. So this idea of integrating all of the parts, and remember, he was used to working with eight pages to tell a story. Got to introduce the plot, theme, setting, character, all in the same time in a limited number of pages. So that means every panel, Every word, every shadow has got to be doing a job because you don't have an unlimited number of them to work with. So showing us how to do the thing is very important. A few years ago, when Warner Brothers DC Comics was doing commemorations of the major characters like Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, they had to do his spirit because it was perceived to be that important a character in the history of the business. 
And in fact, to this day, the top award that you can get in anything related to the comics business is called an Eisner Award, just like you would get an Oscar for the motion pictures or a Grammy for a record. And in fact, a fellow I know who publishes a magazine uh, told me that I could have permission to use a picture of his trophy for this particular program. Just because I happen to know a guy who won one of these things, he let us use a picture of his actual Eisner Award to show you what's going on. And in fact, this week, starting today, nationally, there's a celebration of all of Eisner's work in writing, illustrating, teaching, the business side of it, all of that. So there's an annual celebration that just happens to be beginning today. So perfect timing for what's going on in our course and to get to show you this information and take you backstage to how the business works. Now, the idea of a graphic novel really came about in the late 70s, and he did a short story collection, as I said, about the New York Jewish immigrant experience, the first part of the 20th century. And even if you look at the lettering here, the way the word God is lettered, it looks like Hebrew lettering because if you look at the way of the tails on the letters, it is evocative of what Hebrew writing looks like. So every element has to be doing a job. It has to be advancing the business of the storytelling. So you don't waste any time, any space when you have a chance to add something else that communicates to your reader a really talented person will try and put that in. So as you see, about every 10 years, he would go back to this New York tenement building, a crowded apartment building, and tell stories of the kinds of people that he grew up around and that he knew. We have access to some of the actual original artwork from which the printings were made, and I wanted to show you some of this so that you could examine what it looks like before it gets made all pretty at the printers and published on slick paper. So here you see the the way a page would be assembled. Let me draw your attention to something here with our highlighter. You see the little shadows of the scotch tape where these pieces were lettered and drawn separately and then assembled before they go to the print shop. And I wanted to also draw your attention to that this lettering is all done by hand. Now today, your computer, you can go download fonts that look like handwriting in many different ways. But the idea that somebody would write the story, draw the story, apply the ink to the pencil drawings to prepare it for the printers, and do all the lettering by hand, that was how a lot of the guys did it in the old days. But today we're very accustomed to one person writes a story, one person pencils the pictures, another person applies ink to it for the printing process, another person does the lettering, another person does the coloring. So a committee of people would produce a modern story, but it, in these days, the cartoonists actually took great pride that they did the script and they did the artwork and they would actually letter the thing. So this was a lot of hand craftsmanship that went into the work in this period. In this page, it's a rainy scene and the word rain never appears in the caption. At no point does he say, it was raining on Monday night or whatever it was. He shows you that it's raining. Because we can see things dripping and we can see puddles, right? So why waste one of the very few words that we have room to put on the page to tell me something that I can already see? It would be dumb to say it was raining and give me a picture of a rainy street as if my audience can't figure that out. But 
I draw your attention to something small again. He says the man sloshed homeward. Now we get heavy rainy days here in this part of Florida. And if you have ever had to walk through puddles in wet shoes, you know that gooshy, swishy, squirty sound that is made when you're walking with wet shoes, walking through puddles in the rain. So when he says the man sloshed homeward, yep, I can hear it. I know what wet socks feel like. I totally get it because that word that he chose to use told me that this is a deep, uncomfortable, wet foot kind of rain. So he never said rain and he never put a sound effect on the page where it would be plop, plop or squish, squish or splash, splash. Didn't have to do that. He shows you the street and he gives you a description of a sound that makes you feel like you also have wet socks. This is the whole idea of showing and not telling. In his caption, he says the summer ends, so people are coming back to their sweaty apartment building after having had a summer vacation trip. So they do look like with the deep shadows. Yeah, they're going back to a place and you can see their shoulders are kind of rounded like summer's over and we have to get back to our regular lives. But again, here's a little detail. I draw your attention to the puddle in the street and the fire hydrant. So mechanically, yes, the shadow of the fire hydrant is going the same direction as the shadow of the building and the shadow of the people. And that's art school 101. So that that's one thing. But why is there a puddle? Did it just rain? Or is this after one of those things that we see where kids were playing in the fire hydrant, having it open like a yard sprinkler. And now the kids aren't playing and the nuts on the fire hydrant have been tightened, but there's still some water there in the gutter of the street from when uh, there might have been kids getting out of the hot summer with the fire hydrant sprinkling on them. So there's a whole story just about having a puddle next to the fire hydrant. He doesn't say that. He doesn't show us any kids playing in the fire hydrant. But since that's a common thing in places like New York in the heat of the summer, a little residue of something that people would be familiar with kind of reminds you about that going on without hitting you in the face with it. So slipping in a little bit of extra story content without actually clobbering you with it. That's another strong technique. We have a little girl sitting on the stairs in front of the apartment building, and we can see from the way that he uses the ink that he's created a shadow, right? So we have the glow coming from the one lamp that's in front of the building that illuminates the steps. Can you see that it puts the girl in kind of a halo or a spotlight? Does that tell us that she might be the innocent main character in this story? Because when we are introduced to her, here she is being an ordinary little girl under a street light inside this spotlight or this halo effect. So he has already told you without any words that we should pay attention to this girl, that our story is going to revolve around her somehow. So again, the setup without telling you. If we just said, this is Mary, she will be very important to our story, that would be dull, that would be wasting ink, it would be wasting the reader's time. So instead, here's this girl, innocent situation, sitting in a halo, I have an idea what might be going on in this story. Do we think this guy is going to be the hero of the story or is he going to be a villainous portrayal in the story? We look at his his attitude and his movement and his face, right? And he gets a last name. He's called Mr. Skuggs 
Is Skuggs a pretty sounding name? No, it has some hard consonant sounds in it. So even the way you name a character can tell us something about his personality. But his face and the bulldog's face seem to have a similar demeanor, don't they? They seem to have a similar expression, similar shape to the forehead and the jawline, right? So we have been told that this guy who has an unpleasant sounding name and apparently a, a, a nasty type of posture. And I've just transferred a bulldog's personality from the dog's face to this man's face. Again, small trick. He didn't have to say it. He showed you. Last piece of artwork that I want you to look at. So here's Mr. Skuggs. He lives under the building in the apartment below the steps. And he's just looking out at the street. So we've got this brick building and he lives there in the semi basement, right? But how do we know it's a brick building? Did he draw every brick? Did he take three days counting how many bricks it would be and drawing 150 perfectly proportioned bricks? No. But he outlined and emphasized the shapes of bricks and he had some some tan shadings there to give you the idea of bricks. So just as much as a classic French impressionist painter, a good cartoonist can make you see that as a brick building without drawing hundreds of bricks because they're not doing an architectural rendering. They're doing a cartoon to make you think of a brick building. So from that idea, I can now understand this is an old brick building without thinking I've got to count the bricks or that I've got to draw these bricks and I've got to get out a ruler and be so careful to make all the bricks the perfect proportion. No, I can put in these shadings to indicate the relative size of the bricks and I can outline half of them to really emphasize the brick idea. Boom, it's done. So I've conveyed the idea. I've put you in the setting of the story but didn't have to actually laboriously draw and apply a ruler and a T-square to make all of this stuff happen in such architectural exactness. Instead, I can give you the idea, you see it in the background, so you know a thing without having to be told a thing. So in closing, a very old picture of a young me with Mr. Eisner after one of his seminars, and he was kind enough to autograph one of his pieces for me. So giving you this presentation really was sort of a personal journey for me because I learned so much from him. I'm glad to have the chance to teach you what little I learned from how very much that he knew. <laughs>